Okay, uh, welcome everybody. Uh, welcome to the LSE for this um, hybrid event. And we have many fantastic events at the LSE, but I think tonight's going to be extra special. Um, I'm, I'm Mike Savage, I'm Professor of Sociology at the LSE, um, and I direct a stream of research around the issue of wealth, elites, and tax justice, which is hosting this event tonight. And we are here to have a conversation between Gary Stevenson um, and Rebecca, Rebecca Gowland. Um, Gary, as you probably all know, has this fantastically interesting career. He probably, with this book, is aiming to be one of the most famous LSE alumni of all time, <laughs> um, having done his undergraduate studies here and gone into the city um, and become a, 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 one, of the, one of the most successful traders in the city of London. Uh, which he then, as he talks about, abandoned for a different life. He has since studied for an MPhil at Oxford, worked for economics think tanks, and founded a YouTube channel, Gary's Economics, which is teaching people about real-world economics. I have to say, having read his book, it's a fantastic, fantastic read, you know, and it's, just, it's, it's, it's really riveting, so it's, it's great to have him here. Rebecca Gowland is the executive director of Patriotic Millionaires International, she previously worked in development for 15 years and led global campaigns on poverty and, and inequality with notable success on tax reform in the UK and at the international level. So the plan will be, there'll be a conversation between Rebecca and Gary for about 40 minutes, posing some of the themes of the book. Um, and when that's finished, we'll open the conversation up to people in the audience. We're a hybrid uh, event tonight, so we'll have some questions from in person and we'll have some questions online as well and I'll, I'll, I will moderate that discussion. For Twitter users, the hashtag for today's event is uh, hash LSCIII. It's being recorded and will be made available as a podcast subject to no technical difficulties. All right, that's all done. So let me pass on to Rebecca and Gary to have this conversation. Cool, thank you so much, Mike. Um, yeah, as Mike said, my name's Bex. I, uh, I've worked on inequality, uh, well, for well over a decade, and economic inequality I see as the absolute root of basically every crisis that our world faces, not just the cost of living crisis, the crisis that our world faces in democracy, um, the planetary crisis that we face, the, the, the wealth divide is at the root of all of these crises. And so about three years ago, I decided to try and deploy the most effective tool that we can have, the most effective communications tactic that we can use in uh, getting that message across, which is the voice of millionaires, if you ask me at the minute, um, <clears throat> because it's that unusual voice in the space which you just don't expect. So we set up patriotic millionaires here in the UK, um, and that's what we do here, and that's how I met Gary uh, three or four years ago, who was one of the first people to, to jump on board. Um, and I don't think we've ever sat down for a very long time, Gary, and had a chance to have a conversation. It's always just been over Zoom or at a dinner or whatever. Um, so I'm thrilled to have this opportunity to talk to you about this amazing book, this incredible story. Um, about you, really. About you, from being a working class kid in Ilford to being, you know, at the LSE. And then being a multimillionaire and then being an inequality campaigner. And I, I really want to get into the meat of the book, and we will do that in a minute. But I wanted to start with, with something a bit different, which is the mood of the book and the creativity that has gone into it. If you haven't read the book, it reads like a novel. It's really quite exceptional. I loved reading it. Because the themes around inequality and around people feeling small in a, in a very imposing world are just kind of captured in the images that you use and the scenery that you use. And that starts right at the beginning with the prologue and Caleb, but there's this huge, menacing physical presence. And I just kind of wanted to hear a bit from you as to like, was that intentional? Was it intentional, that creativity, like writing it like a novel or did it just come out in the process? I only really, really read novels. I don't really read a lot of non-fiction because um, I do a lot of non-fiction in my life, right. basically. Um, I, uh, that's funny, that first, the first scene in the book is basically me being like, quite intensely threatened. Am I right with the mic, by the way? Yeah. Close enough. Yeah. The first scene in the book is me being quite intensely threatened by an, an enormous, yeah. very wealthy trader in, um, in a Tokyo ramen bar in a skyscraper. And that, that was almost, I just wanted to capture this moment 
you know what I was inspired by for that scene was the opening scene of Goodfellas. Just wanted to be like, just catch the most mental scene of the book and put it at the beginning. Because it's this, this huge, for some reason, everyone, the editors were like, why are you describing all the traders as huge? And it's like, because they were all huge. Yeah. Why were you always saying their heads are huge? Because their heads were huge, <laughs> basically. But, um, yeah, I was sitting slumped down in this chair in the ramen, and by then I was in a, a very deep depression. The, the book takes a sort of journey of mental health, and this guy is basically saying to me, you know, if you leave, if you try and leave, we are, we're going to destroy you, basically. We're going to take everything you've ever had. You'll be left with nothing. Um, he literally says to me, I think you're a good person, but bad things happen to good people. Yeah. Like a, and um, I, what I really wanted to do with the book... Um, Obviously, you know me through political campaigning, and a lot of people here will know me through political campaigning, and I'm a political campaigner. But um, I didn't want the book to be explicitly political at all. I wanted it to be experiential. I want you to feel like you're there with me at the table with this big guy threatening to destroy everything you've ever worked for. And I want you to be with me, 18 years old, turning up at this place, you know, with a massive bottle of cider, you know, thinking it's going to be a party, you know. Mm -hmm. With 21-year-old me walking onto the trading floor for the first time, because I was not a political person, I wasn't raised in a political family. I was just a kid from East London who wanted to make money. And I made a lot of money, I had a lot of success by realising and betting on the fact that the global economy was going to completely collapse for ordinary people. And I think that story, if, you, if, you, if I can take you on, on that journey with me, that is going to be so much more politicising than any graph yeah, or like set of statistics I can do. Yeah. Yeah, that's certainly how I felt about it. It was completely captivating. Um, yeah, so tell us, about, tell us about growing up then. Tell us about where it all started. Tell yeah. us about the shadows of Canary Wharf, growing up in Ilford, working class kid, paper round. Yeah. No one expects a kid like that to be kind of the leading trader at Citibank. So tell us about yeah, you so as a kid. I'm from Ilford. Ilford is, I say it's London, but a lot of Essex people like to claim it. Um, not too far off, it's about 10 miles east <coughs> of here, and I grew up on in a little terraced house, on a street for little terraced houses. Um, you know, small house, small bedroom, like bunk bed, railway in the back garden. Um, and we were, we were poor. I would say like poor, sort of verging on very poor. There, were, there definitely were poor people around. We were poor and, you know, playing football in the streets, this kind of thing. Um, it's a very immigrant area, so I grew up with a lot of like recent Pakistani migrants, Indian migrants. and. Um, I was very good at maths, really, every, everything kind of come from, I was very good at maths, and I think if you, if you grow up good at maths, you kind of, there's this assumption you grew up in East London good at maths, you were going to go work in the city, you don't really know what that means, um, but we saw the skyscrapers grow up when I was, the first one probably went up when I was like seven or eight, mm. and um, you just kind of think you, you, you're going to go work in there, this is the opening scene, one of the opening scenes of the book is me sort of playing football on the street, and you see the skyscrapers in the distance, and um, you think... There's one, one scene, I'm sitting on top of it, smoking on the top of a multi-story car park with my friend, who in the book is called Jamie, mm -hmm. and telling him, yeah, when I grow up, I'm going to go work in them skyscrapers. And he's laughing at me, but, but he thought that I would, and everybody thought that I would, because... Did they? Like, I'm, I'm interested to hear about that. Yeah. Like, did everybody who, who, was, who was around you when you were a kid expect you to go yeah. on? You did? I was mad as a kid. I was mad as a kid, like... Um, I, had, I was very competitive, I had to win every competition and um, people at school would be like, oh we know like, you're, you're studying really hard and you go on. Then they'd come to my house and realise there's no desk, you know what I mean? Mm. He's just like, he's not studying, he's just playing football all day. And then people think like, he's going to, I think, I, yeah, yeah, you obviously met me when I was sort of in my 30s, but if you meet me at 16, it's just this kid is like, get rich or die trying. And I think if you, if you ask any of my mates at 16, he's going to make it there. Even when I was expelled from school, mm. I never really... Doubted. Even when I turned up here and it was full of like kids of Arab dictators, I was like, it's alright. I'm still going to make it. Yeah, it doesn't matter how much you pay to send your kid here, I'm still going to beat him. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting to me to, to hear that because I, I wondered if like everybody on your street who wanted to, everybody wants to be a millionaire, right? But mm. maybe you felt more drive for it because it felt attainable to you compared to everybody. I just, I knew I had this. I, this talent, I didn't know where it, I would enter competitions and just win them. Yeah, I don't want to sort of act like, but that's what was happening, you know what I mean? And you, you, I don't think I deserve to be there any more than those kids around me. Yeah. But everybody there knew this kid's got this thing. And um, when I was 16, I was expelled from school for selling drugs. Yeah. And in a day, 
you go from the kid that's going to go to Cambridge to the kid that's going to go to prison yeah. in everybody's mind. And um, I wasn't going to let it beat me. And I thought, well, this is a recurring theme throughout the book. And sometimes I perhaps yeah. take it too far. But, you know, there's not a lot of kids that speak like me, even in a place like this, even this is in London and in the Canary Wharf, even though it's in East London. And um, if, if the door's open for one of us, I think you've got an obligation to, to, to try and get through. I couldn't agree more. Um, so you, you, the door was opened, you got expelled from school, fine, but then you went on and you found yourself here at this very prestigious, fancy, globally renowned university. Yeah. Um, I loved reading when you went to university. It, it, it chimed a lot with my experience going to university, <laughs> feeling really out of you place. You went to Oxford. Oxford. Yeah. So I felt really out of place as a, as a working class kid. Yeah, yeah. Um, didn't know what was going on, didn't understand the acronyms that were used. And so reading that in the book and you kind of saying that in your experience of going to university, I, I found that really, really compelling. Um, and then kind of rocking up in a tracksuit in your first year, head down, getting on with it, working really hard. So then I find when you went to your second year yeah. that everybody else has like sorted out internship after internship. They all know what's going on. Yeah, and yeah. you had no idea what was going on. You felt completely out of place. Yeah. Like, did that, did that affect you feeling out of place or did it just make you more fixated on what you were going to do next? Yeah, so I, I turned up here at 18, about to turn 19. 2005, uh, we're in an echo track seat. I studied maths and economics, which is at the time the only course in the maths department. Um, I remember we got sent on like a get to know each other trip to this like manor in the countryside. It's called Cumberland Lodge. I think they still do Cumberland yeah, yeah. Lodge trip. Yeah, yeah. And um, <laughs> I, bought a, I brought a three litre bottle of like Tesco cider. Gorgeous. And I was like, obviously, this is going to be like American pie, right? So I went like, with, with like the math department to Cumberland Lodge, like ready to get absolutely bladdered. And like everyone was meeting in one of my friend's rooms. It's a guy in the book, actually, Matic, who's still kind of my friend today. And um, I, I brought this like bottle of cider to his room in this Cumberland, and I knocked on the door and he opened it. He's like, what's that? I'm like, cider. And he's like, you better not get any on the floor. And I went in there, and they were playing chess. They were playing chess. And, um, but, I, I, you know, obviously, I, I went to Oxford more recently, and weirdly, I look back very fondly on my time at the, the maths department is a lovely place, in a weird way. Like, maths, maths people are a bit weird, and I suppose I'm a bit weird. Um, it, was, it was intimidating at first. My high school didn't do further maths, didn't yeah. do economics. So I was, like, way behind at first. Um, but I just... It's a challenge, and this was, this was the first time I really saw class. Yeah. You know, you come here and it's like the kids like, like parking Lamborghinis around the corner. And I think that was like, that lit a fire in me a little bit like, the, the, beating these guys will be really fun. It terrified me. Yeah? I, yeah, when I first, because I grew up in a tiny town in North East Yorkshire, and I just didn't have a clue that class even existed. Yeah. You know? So you arrive in Oxford and all of a sudden you're yeah. completely overwhelmed by the yeah. fact that it really does keep but stabbing you in the eye. You know, one thing, I've been here and I've been to Oxford. And um, at Oxford, I got, I got told off like really angrily, really seriously for leaving a three-hour macroeconomics exam with my bow tie done up incorrectly. Mm -hmm. And I was 31. Yeah. And so I think... <laughs> Weirdly, I think I kind of feel now about LSE a bit the same way I feel about Canary Wharf, which is this, it's this kind of new money anonymous place. Mm. But it's not dripping in that like blue blood English class system in the way that maybe Oxford or the city is. And I felt like it was, it was mine to be Does one. that make it better though? I don't know if it makes it better, but if, if, for me, I suppose, you know, I, I read very working class. People can tell I'm working class, but you come here and you know, someone's from Singapore, they can't understand what you're saying. They've got no idea. They're just yeah. like, why have you got a rhino on your hoodie? You know yeah. what I mean? And um, yeah. it was, uh, really, I, I loved it and I, and I had a good time and um, I'm still friends with a lot of my people from LSE. So those who haven't read the book, but there's an LSE section in it. Sure and uh, I, I think it's very honest and I, I think, um, I don't think it's, it's negative, but it is a mad place. People here who know, will know it's a mad place. I don't know if it, it's very honest. The whole book's very honest. Um, <laughs> I, I, what do you think LSE? Do you think LSE equipped you for what you learned throughout the book? Do you yeah. think it equipped you for what you learned about inequality? Do you think it equipped you with what you needed to, to work in the city, for example? You know what? Yeah. It really did. I'll tell you why. Because I, I went to Oxford, and there was one kid who at Oxford. I say kid. He was like twenty-seven, right? And um, he had did his undergrad in Greece, right? Mm. 
And he'd studied in Greece and he came to Oxford like, and he really wanted to understand economics, he wanted to understand everything. And, and we got to our first year and he did pretty badly in his, in his first year exams. And he was really upset. He was a good friend of mine. And, and I, I, I said, why are you upset? And he goes, I did badly. I was like, yeah, what do you expect? You're trying to understand things. Mm. Right? Economics is not about trying to understand things. If you want to do well at economics, go to the library 100 hours a week and memorise the algebra. Everyone here knows this. LSE teaches you this, right? Listen, the world that we live in is about playing the game. Mm -hmm. And you go, into the, you go into the city and it's about playing the game. And there's people who come out from Oxford and Bocconi in Italy and these fancy universities in Athens that think understanding the economy is going to get you anywhere. Listen, that's finished. Listen, there, I heard that back in like medieval China. If you wanted to get a good job, you needed to master Chinese calligraphy. You needed to be able to write 10,000 characters beautifully. That is economics. Economics is a job. It's, it's, it's almost a subject design that if you're really rich and your kid is not that smart, if he studies really hard, he can get a job for Goldman Sachs. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's pure, like, it's that. And, and this is why, you know, I was able to be the top student here and I was able to be the top trader. Because yeah. listen, I think one thing that people don't really think about it when you destroy class mobility is one consequence of that is places that should be full of smart kids um, are full of rich kids. Absolutely. And that is such an opportunity. Yeah. That is such an opportunity. And LSE trains you perfectly. Play the game. Play mm. the game. Make the connections. And kids that come out of other universities trying to understand stuff, listen, that's so 20th century. Like, move on. <laughs> Don't try and understand stuff. Is Gary's big lesson today. Um, OK, let's talk about the game then. Let's talk a bit about the game. Let's talk about how you eventually got to work at Citibank, right? Because the internship really wasn't working for you. That mm. wasn't going to happen. Yeah. Uh, so you find yourself like playing the, a game that Citibank have set up the trading game, which I'd li like you to tell us more about, especially that final round. Yeah. Because when we've talked before, yeah. I've always had the impression that, you know, you just won it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But you didn't. More complicated than that. You, you yeah. didn't win it. They kind of set you up. Yeah, yeah. Tell us about what that felt like. All right, so very quickly, right, I guess there's some LSE students here. Uh, like, second year is mental. Everyone's applying for, like, 35 investment banks. And, like, they've all, like, got these amazing CVs where they've, like, they were, like, head of the junior United Nations and they've founded a charity that for some reason drives dirt bikes through the Sahara Desert and they've played like the clarinet at the Royal Albert Hall and you're like, if some of you are at LSE from my background, you'll be thinking like, literally, I was working for McDonald's. I was working for DFS Bluffing Pillows. Like, how am I going to compete with these guys? And um, I just started being really aggressive in lectures and hoping that people would like notice who I was and actually work. So a yeah. guy in the book is called Luke Blackwood from Grimsby, not too far from where you're from, yeah. comes up to me in the library. And this is such an LSE thing to happen. You're sitting there like, doing like some Riemann Stiltzer's integrations. And some guy from Grimsby comes up like, are you Gary Stevenson? Yeah. Citibank hires one trader a year through a card game, just teaches me the card game and just leaves. And I was like, all right, all right. So and it's basically a betting game. And the, the first thing I did was I, I knew exactly how LSE students and economic students would play this game, which is they would get the numbers and they'd work out the expected value. Simple. And that made the game so easy to win because you're, you've got a betting game one guy's got a high card and his expected value is 72. One guy's got a low card and his expected value is 57. So I was just like, buy 57, sell 72, buy, like a hundred times. Yeah. And they just thought like, he's a maniac basically because he's not done his expected values. But I just won the game really easily, which is kind of a great metaphor for the way that LSE works and the way that economics works. But then that got me into the final. Mm. And um, looking back, so I basically for three weeks just stopped going to lectures which is a classic LSE thing to do, because I was like just um, memorising this one stupid card game, because it was my plan in. And looking back, I think now most of the other guys in that final basically figured, we'll go there, we'll like network someone, and we'll get that name to put on the application form, and that will get us in. And, and I was the only guy like, I'm going to win this game, basically. Mm. And um, there was like five or six like, like rounds to decide the final of the final. And um, I did really well in those rounds, and I got through to the final of the final. We get into the final and I've got like a really, really low card. So I know that the total's gonna to be like really, really, really low. And um, my plan was to be like really aggressive, like push the price up and then like sell at a high price. And I'm just going for it, selling, 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 selling. And the price is like really high. And like mathematically, it's almost impossible for me to lose with a price this high and my card so low. And we keep playing the game and I'm just thinking I'm killing, I'm killing. And these cards get turned over during the game and the cards keep coming up really high. And I'm thinking, okay, this is a bit weird, but we just keep punching the price higher. Then finally, at the end of the game, all the cards go down. All of the other players in the game have the highest possible cards. And the chance of it is like one in a million or something. And I'd and lose, my score is like minus 10,000 or something. And I absolutely like smashed. And I, I realised immediately, like, 
this is impossible, statistically impossible. Mm. I've been like, rigged, like, but to be honest, I just stood there and I think when you come from my sort of background and you, you kind of just expect these things to happen. Yeah. You just expect, and I just thought, okay, I've been screwed over again. Whatever. Like, what's yeah. plan C? And then this guy, Caleb, the big antagonist of the book, stands up and says, the winner of the game is Gary Stevenson. And he says, Gary was so good in the warm-up rounds that we wanted to see what he did when like, everything went against him, mm. whether he was going like, to back himself, whether he was going to back down. And he backed himself and that's what we like. So he's the winner and he's in. To me, it's like the perfect example of how like working class kids just get played or even just mm. kids now get played again and again and again you set up to think you, you're told if you work hard enough you're going to make it and that's just not true anymore yeah 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 it kind of but it reminds me of then you know later on i go and i get my big bonus and I, they even that was a game that led me to believe my bonus is going to be much smaller than it actually mm. is and i think these guys they see me coming through and they just play games with me again and again. They love to play, they love to play games with the little Well, you love playing budget. games as well, though, right? Yeah, and yeah. I'm kind of in a weird way, I appreciate it. Yeah. I, in a weird way, I appreciate, But at least they let me in, you yeah. know what I mean? They yeah, let me in. Yeah. Um, but it's this kind of, yeah, it's a beautiful microcosm of the society we live in. I was like, you know, one of the top students here. And I had to get my job by cheating in a card game, mm. which I lost yeah. and was put through. Yeah. And this is like, you know... It's very <laughs> twisted. So, so moving into your kind of working life then, Gary, and, and, and going and working at City, again, like the whole, the experience of, like the reader's experience when you, you enter that, that trading floor, really, it's like a film, it's like you're watching a film and you're reading it, it's, it's really uh, immersive. The, and I think the, one of the reasons why it's so immersive is the characters, right? Yeah. Yeah. The characters on that floor are wild. Uh, they're either completely unhinged or seem like complete idiots yeah. um, I'd love for you to talk just a bit about those characters and for me personally yeah. please tell us more about Rupert Rupert, Rupert yeah. is crazy yeah right? Rupert Rupert is one of these he's described in the book as looking as if he'd been unexpectedly dropped off at boarding school when he was 8 years old mm -hmm. and not picked up till he was 21 mm -hmm. which I later found out was not far from the truth <laughs> and he's um, <coughs> the thing is he's, an, he's a mentalist He's, a, he's an absolute nutter. Like one time, he used to take me out drinking. Like he used to, like, he used to call me Gary the Geezer. I was like his little like cockney sidekick in Clapham, which is like 20 miles from Milford. And um, he used to like take me around. And one time, I got really drunk, and I, I, he made me stare in his house. And I come in the next day, and I throw up, and I got sent home. And the next morning, the boss tells this guy Rupert, Gary said that it was your fault that he got drunk. The one, yeah. And um, I knew straight away this guy's going to be like. And he, I used to sit. There was an empty seat next to me. And he was on the next seat, and I'm just like, don't look at Rupert. Don't look at Rupert. And then I just like hear in the background, I just start to hear like, like a, like, like, a, like, a, like, a, like a low growl and I'm just like, don't look at Rupert, don't look, and then it just gets louder, like, like and, and just don't look at the guy and then I hear this bang, this bang, and he's kicked, he's kicked his, the doors under the desk and they banged against like the brackets behind and I'm like, now I think like, you fucking have to look at him. I looked at him and he was leaning on the desk, he was like arched around to me like this and he was gnashing his teeth like a dog, like, <laughs> like, like that, right in my face, across this, on the trading floor, full of traders. And he did this for like 20 seconds, like right in my face, like, <sighs> and I just, um, I didn't know what to do, but <laughs> look, I looked at it, because you, you, you know in your heart of hearts you look away, but it's like one of the most fantastic things you've ever hey, seen yeah. in your life, and you're, yeah. sort of, you're like watching this guy, like, oh my God, I can't, and then you just look away, look away, and then just don't look at him, and then you just, like the... He stops gnashing his teeth and the, his, the growling subsides, like, slowly. And then he never mentioned it again. <laughs> no, no, nobody ever mentioned it again. And it's wild. Are you just, um... Uh, but this, and this guy, I, also, I don't even really feel... He, he had these weird moments, like, of, of real compassion. Mm. Real, like, when Harry's mum passed away, he was the guy that was there. Yeah. And towards the end of the book, when I'm in a bad time, he's the guy that comes in. And um, it's like he knows that he's messed up. There's this one like, amazing scene where he's like, screwed over one of my best mates and he walks me down the street and he says, Gary, yeah. I've got a problem. I've got a problem. When I meet someone, I need to know immediately if they're better than me or they're worse than me. And if they're better than me, I hate them. I hate them for being better than me. Yeah. But if they're worse than me, I despise them. And it's even worse. Mm. I despise them because they're worse than me. And I think this is, this is like a little bit of a microcosm of what it does to people and what it does to society. For me, this is like one of the big messages of the book. When you, when you drive competition into the, like the soul of a man and the soul of a society as like the founding yeah. value. And I think we, 
I, I talked about how I was competitive, you know, this is full of LSC students, there's going to be a lot of competitive people here that want to do well in their exams, want to destroy their friends in their exams, and um, this is what you have to do, you know, to get a good job in today's society, but, you know, I think we think about competition and ambition as, like, positive traits, but there's a dark side to them as well, and I think Rupert, and, and also myself, can catch that a little bit of what oh, that Oh, completely, what that can be. like, there's a, there's a real theme of addiction through the book, actually, yeah. like, with, like, various characters, whether you're addicted to Swedish FX swaps, yeah. or... You know, alcohol, yeah. um, there is a real theme of addiction within that group of men, really. And I, I guess I really wanted to touch on that because the, the book is dominated by men, right? 100%. And it's yeah. Not just dominated by men, it's dominated by really toxic behaviour, yeah. whether it's stealing shoes or, um, you know, aggression, violence, throwing yeah. phones at people's heads. <laughs> yeah. All kinds of really horrible things, really toxic behaviour. Yeah. That can't be good for anybody. It yeah. couldn't be good for you in your working life or your personal yeah. life. Arguably, that guy needed a phone phone at that time. Well, I mean, it worked, yeah. but I think that's the world that he, that's the world that he lived in. Um, yeah, it's people sometimes ask me, would the trading floor be a better place if there were more women? I mean, there are so few women; it definitely would be a better place. Mm. But I think there's there's something more there's something worse at the base there. There's something. Yeah. It's, it's about a competition at the heart of it. Competition at the and and I think what when I so I, I read the audio book. Audio book's very good, by the way. It's, but, um, I read the audio book and I went back and it's sometimes difficult to read because the book is very emotional and at times very sad mm. but what I found strange when I read the audio book was that the times when I got the most emotional reading the audio book were when the traders showed one another kindness mm. um, because it's easy to be like oh traders are am I not, I'm not allowed to swear right? I'm not, you're already swear. up Gary you've already, already yeah, you've already oh, done that yeah God. sorry I'm trying to stop that. Um, traders, these traders are terrible people. Or what terrible people the traders are. Wolf of Wall Street, aren't they awful? American Psycho. It's, it's easy to be like that. But then I work with these people. And yeah, a lot of these people did bad things. But there's moments when they show this kindness. Mm -hmm. And that's in those moments you remember, these guys are just real people. Yeah. And they don't necessarily want to be like this. And I think that we've created this society, because I was one of them, right? We've created this society that tells you compete, compete, be the best, win, yeah. make more, make more. And, and it, it makes you become like this. And I don't think, I don't think it's, I don't think it's good. And, it, you know, you see it in me, you see it in me towards the end, like I start losing my mind. And there's one bit where I'm in the biggest fight with Citibank and I sort of, I start talking to myself. Mm. And there's one bit where like, it's me versus Citibank and it's clear Citibank wants to sue me. And it's like, how do we, how do we stop them from suing? What's the strategy? What do we do next? Where do we go here? And there's one little moment where I break away and I say to myself, go to sleep, Gary. And it was heartbreaking when I read that. Mm. Because you see, like, what it does to people and how in need of kindness <coughs> these people and how in need of kindness I were. And it's, it's, I think a lot of people read this book and be, and you know, I've seen it in some of the reviews, oh, this is like a castigation of the trading floor. For me, it's not a castigation of the trading floor. No. I worked with those men. And a lot of them did bad things, but they're not in their heart of hearts bad people. I see them do good things, and I see them do kind things. For me, this is what, what happens to young people when you tell them the only thing that matters is winning. Yeah, and the next thing to get, to have. Yeah, yeah absolutely. It's an environment that we've all created. Um, just sticking with that kind of one more character, just to explore a little bit, which yeah. is Billy. Oh, Billy. You know, your hero. Love, you hero, hero. yeah. I'm yeah. not sure that we all love Billy any more <laughs> than anybody else, actually, yeah. in the book. Um, there's this m huge moment of clarity that Billy brings for you, like a very famous scene in the book, uh, where you've really cocked up and you've lost a lot of money. Yeah. Um, and you've brought in your books from LSE and you're sat yeah, there yeah, reading yeah. and trying to figure out what you've done wrong and how the economy works. And he just kind of slams those books shut and says to you, yeah. if you want to understand the economy, you've got to go out there and have a look, look around you, open your eyes. Yeah. And you do that. But I would love to know, did you do it that night? What did you do? Did you actually literally go and ask your mum about how the economy works? Like Not that night. So I guess it's an important thing to talk about here at LSE. So yeah, I, I had a very good first year, 2009. 2010, I get hit with one really bad week. I lose $8 million in a week, massive week. And a lot, I, my instinct is what a lot of people's here instinct would be, I imagine. I was at LSE, mass and economic student. I literally start bringing my textbooks into the office, which now seems crazy. But that's, you know, you think you're here for a reason, right? To study the economy. So you bring them in and... This guy, Billy, is from Liverpool, never went to university, worked his way up from being on a cash desk at Halifax. Genius trader. He grabs his book, throws them in the bin, go home. And like, How old do you think you're going to learn from these books, mate? You're not a kid anymore. Mm. If you want to know about the economy, go home, ask your mum. And I think he's walked down the street, look at the shops open, down, closing. 
Look at the adverts on the tube. Look at the, how many homeless people there are. Ask your friends and your friends' mums. And I think this is a very important message to say at a place like this where we're kind of convinced that somehow understanding the economy is about inverting matrices. Like, really, if, you, if you're trying to understand the economy and you've inverted a single matrix, you've messed up, right? Like, it should be obvious, right? And um, I, didn't, you know, I didn't go home immediately and do that. I think it's sort of... You sit and you sink, it sinks in for a while and you start thinking... I even do this now when I meet new people. I try and ask them... You try and find out what's going on where you're from economically. What's it like? What are the problems? This and that kind of thing. Um, and of course, you know, it's, I was making quite a lot of money that time. And you can't just be like, what's your financial situation? You have to try and find ways to be sort of delicate about it and careful about it. But I think, especially in a place like this where there's a lot of students who are from rich backgrounds. And even if you're not from a rich background, you've got a good chance of going on to get a well-paid job. Um, it's so important that you understand that the economy is not numbers, it's people. Yeah. And Billy taught me that, and, you know, it was that understanding, it's kind of an irony in a way, understanding that the economy is numbers, not people, that made me a millionaire. That, that's a bit the wild bit, right? Yeah. You, you kind of, he does that before you, before 2011, when, yeah. when actually, it's the realisation that you have that inequality is just going to get worse. Yeah. Yeah? And that's when you really start making money. Do you want to talk to us a bit about that, like, that moment? Those yeah, bets so making. I was an interest rates trader, right? The history of interest rates prediction is quite interesting because in 2008, rates collapsed to zero. Nobody predicted it. Then in 2009, everyone says rates come up and they don't. In 2010, everyone says rates come up and they don't. Mm. And that happens again 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, yeah. until 2020, when everybody finally agrees <laughs> rates will never go up. So it's like an, um, it's, it's actually like we couldn't be worse at this if we tried. And this is something that anyone who's studying economics should probably sit and think, why is it that we've been wrong about this massive macroeconomic variable for like 15 years? Um, so I realised we were wrong on this thing, right? And I know the theory. I know the theory you're supposed to like, that's money, low rates, supposed to get people spending. But you're, you're seeing there's no way your friends can spend more. They're losing their homes, right? Like, these guys are like on a long-term trend to zero. They can't spend more. And then 2011, before the sovereign debt crisis, I get called into a meeting, and they're like, all of these big governments, Italy, Spain, Portugal, Ireland, Greece, UK, USA, Japan, massive deficits, running into big debts, selling off their assets. So then you see governments are losing their assets and going into debt. Ordinary families are selling off their assets and going into mm. debt. And it's important, I think, to realise that it's impossible for everyone simultaneously to sell off their assets and go into debt. So I'm sort of like bouncing this around, like, who is it? Who is it? And of course, the irony is, I'm sitting in a room full of like pink shirted millionaires, right? yeah. and you realise, like, it's us. It's us. Like, it's, we are the guys who are bankrupting the middle class. It's not, it's not a coincidence that this group of very wealthy people, their wealth is exploding at the same time as the wealth of the middle class and government is collapsing. And I think it's what. It's, it's so amazing that we as economists have managed to treat these two things as if they're separate phenomena. It's amazing. And I realised, like, not only is this going to happen, but it's going to get worse. Because if an ordinary family can't run a balanced budget when they own their house, yeah. then they can't when they don't own their house. And if the government can't run a balanced budget when they're not in a massive debt, then they, then they can't when they are in a massive debt. So you realise it's going to spiral. It's going to get worse. It's going to get worse. And there's this sort of... I think it's a nice scene in the book where you have this realisation where you're like, this is it. This is the problem. It's cancer. It gets worse, it gets worse, it gets worse. I've got to buy green euro dollars. Yeah. Because that's what we're trained to do, and that is what places... You know, I, I don't hate this place. I like this place. I had a great time here. But that is what places like this and places like those skyscrapers in Canary Wharf train very good young economists like me to do. Mm -hmm. To look at the economy, to understand what's happening, and no matter how horrible it is, bet on it. Yeah. But what did that feel like then? So you, you make these bets, you know what you're doing. Yeah. Like you're betting that everyone's life is going to get worse. Yeah. What did that feel like? Because you talk about like the economy, because you, 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 Billy's told you you close your books, you've gone out, you've talked to your mum, you've yeah. talked to your friends. You know that the economy is actually the hole in Harry's shoes. Like, yeah, yeah, that yeah. is what the economy is. Yeah. What, does it, what did it feel like knowing that that is what you were betting against? When I put that bet on, it was the beginning of 2011, so I was 24. So really, I was in the mind of this, like, I'm a young man who's kind of moving into that space of, I'm not just going to copy what people around me are doing. I'm going to start doing my own thing. I'm going to start trying to be better than these people. I'm going to start trying to understand it. And it was just, it was the, it was the game, it was the competition, right? And it wasn't, I'm not thinking about social things. It's like, they're betting things will get better, I bet things will get worse. And when I put it on, I was confident. But it's, you're, you're playing a game, right? And then, but then it happens. And I think that the crazy thing is this, you bet on the collapse of society and you get paid like two million pounds. Yes. And everyone's like, that's great. And, and, but the thing is, 
nobody around me. It's easy for you and me to be here like that. Must everyone around me? Everyone. Was like, like that is great. amazing. Yeah, well you done, are yeah. the guy, and there's not no <laughs> bell you can ring on the corner of the trading floor like ding, ding, ding. Economy is collapsing. Society is collapsing. You know, it's, you know, not like that. You know, that's, and I think this is the way we have we have structured society. You know, I put the, at the end. There's a thanks to God at the end of the book, yeah. or whoever it was who made it so easy to bet on terrible things and so hard to stop them. Mm. But this is the way we've we've constructed our society. But and and you. But you, what happened to me is. I started to feel it like physically. Mm. It wasn't really, I wasn't thinking this is wrong. I start to like become like sick physically, basically. And um, because the thing is, you know, you know, I don't know how political your family was growing up. I didn't grow up in a family or in a space that was like, you have an obligation to prevent society yeah. from collapsing. I grew up on a broken fucking mattress. You know what I mean? It, and it's, and, I went from very quickly from being very poor to very rich and it, you know, I, I would never point at the poor and say you have a job to fix this but then suddenly I'm a millionaire and I'm betting on the collapse but it's, it's and I was 24, you know what I mean? It brings me to actually thinking a bit about like, I think it actually it's a constant theme through the book Gary, I don't think mm -hmm. it's a theme at the end like this, the story of loss and unhappiness actually yeah. runs through the entire book so the confusion that you feel when you arrive at university, the confusion that you feel when you arrive at the start desk, you know, not going to a football match with your dad anymore. Yeah. Ultimately, I think the biggest loss in the book is you losing Harry, because that mm. to me is like the pivotal relationship in the book, <coughs> above and beyond yeah, yeah. And then at the end, really, you've lost sight of yourself, right? Completely yeah. lost sight of yourself. And you find yourself in this horrible depression um, towards the end of your career when you're at the bank. And I just wondered what, why do you think you found yourself there? Is it because you'd spent such a long time betting on the end of the world? Yeah. Was it that that kind of drove the depression or was it the competition? Yeah. What was it? So I, I, start, I start trying to like kick people around me and I, I managed to get myself kicked over to Japan. Mm. And um, I grew up in, in London and in a very multicultural area of London and I think growing up in that kind of space, I thought, perhaps a bit naively, that I'm a very cultured person. But the thing is, Everyone around me was from London. And I don't think until you've lived in another place you realise how much the air of a place gets into your skin. Mm. And I grew up in the shadows of these skyscrapers, you know what I mean? In poverty, surrounded by wealth. And you want it, you want it, mm. you want it. And then I, then I get kicked to Japan and I try and leave in Japan. And circumstances contrive such that I'm basically forced to spend 18 months cycling around Tokyo eating ramen. Mm. And there's, there's one scene which my editor tried to cut actually didn't let him cry. Um, where I go to karaoke. And um, karaoke is massive in Japan. And um, I hated it. I'm actually, I'm actually quite a good singer. But I hate it I, because I was very self-conscious. They always make you go up and sing Wonder Woman. Because yeah. you're English. And, um, and I, I went karaoke with a bunch of sort of maniac friends I'd made. And you go up and you sing Wonder Woman, blah, blah, blah. And you sit down and look quite depressed. And this old man, I remember like, like it was yesterday. His name was Hayashi. Sits me down. And he says to me, I know, the, thing you, down here. the thing you need to know yeah. about karaoke is it doesn't matter whether you sing well or sing badly. What matters is that your guests have a good time. Mm. And I think there's, I don't want to be one of these like idealistic Japan is a perfect place because it's not. But there's such a different taste in the air about selfishness in that place. And I, I never realised until I went to Japan what a selfish person I was. It never really occurred to me. And then you go to this place and where people try and make sure you sit in the right seat in the taxi for no reason, you know what I mean? And you, people are just obsessed with other people and making sure other people are okay. And it sort of... It gave me a bit of time to sort of... realise maybe that's what matters. You know, maybe it doesn't matter so much whether you sing well or sing badly. Maybe it matters that your guests have a good time. Mm. And that changed how I did karaoke. And I, now I enjoy karaoke much more. And I think, this, I think there's a... But I think it's a, there's a true, there's a, I think we, we, we are told, I was told, you need to win, you need to win. If you don't win, you're going to be unhappy, you're going to be poor, you're going to be unhappy. And I think it, it made me into a person that was very obsessed with myself. Mm. And that shrunk me as a person. It diminished me as a person. And I think I was allowed myself as a young person to be fooled that we as people have to choose in life between ourselves and others. And I think that's a, I think that's a lie. This was the only question that I was desperate to ask <laughs> okay. you while I was sat up here, which yeah. was your favourite rule of life, because in the book, 
I believe somebody tried to make you cut that bit out. It's literally my favourite part in the book. Yeah. Because that, that lesson is pivotal, right? The need to put community before you put yourself actually makes you feel so much better about life and about yeah. who you are in life. I loved that as a lesson and I see that as a kind of, that's a really kind of the, the hopeful end of the book, if you ask me. Um, yeah, love that bit. And I love karaoke as well, so yeah. you know. We'll yeah. go sometime, we'll go sometime. I'd love that, yeah. yeah. I'll do, I won't tell you my song until after that. Um, okay, a couple more questions and I'll hand over mic. Uh, solutions, moving on to solutions yeah. to this horrible economic layers that we are stuck in and, and seemingly, well, definitely getting worse. And the book certainly tells us that we're in a big, fat mess. Um, so there's research out last year that said that in 1989, public assets in this country were the value of about £340 billion in yeah. 1989. Yeah. Fast forward to 2023 public assets in this country are worth minus 1,600 billion pounds, right? Yeah. The past 40 years, basically, the assets of this country have been stripped away from us as a nation. And I see that as, as a reflection of what is happening to every, basically every single family in this country, whether you're working, you know, poor, middle class, everyone's assets are being stripped from them now. That is the story of this book, yeah. where the money is going, where the wealth is going. I, I want you to try and answer this question. Yeah. Who or what do you point the finger at for that? Is it the people that you worked with? Is it the politicians? Is it the system? Who constructed the system? Who or what should be taking a long hard look in the mirror? And, yeah. and what we, should we be doing about that? I point the finger at me. At you? At me. It has to be me. This is 18 months ago when Liz trusted her budget, slash tax on rich people. Mm -hmm. At that point, I've been doing a YouTube saying, trying to convince ordinary people you have to tax rich people more mm -hmm. for about two and a half years. And then Liz Truss comes out, slashes tax on rich people. I knew immediately it was going to be a humanitarian disaster in this country. Yeah. And my first thought was, this is my fault. Because if I'd done my job well enough, the Conservative Party would know they couldn't get away with this. And... Your job as a, an inequality campaigner. Yeah. 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 Listen... People sometimes ask me, are you going to go into politics? Right? I'm, in, I'm in politics. If I join the Labour Party, I have to do what the Labour Party tells me to do, right? But if I get five million followers on YouTube, they have to do what I tell them to do. Mm -hmm. um, the politicians are not going to fix this. They're not going to fix this. Because Richard Zunak is worth £700 million, and David Cameron made £10 million within years of leaving office, and Tony Blair is worth £100 million, and Boris Johnson will be worth £20 million. They're not going to fix it. The problem with the crisis of inequality is it looks great from the top. And I made a very conscious shift away from writing articles for The Guardian towards YouTube, Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, because the people who are going to be hurt here are ordinary people. And ordinary people overwhelmingly don't have a voice. But they are the only people who can protect themselves. Because the people whose job it is to protect you are not going to protect you. So I think, I honestly think we, we will only be able to get an improvement here if when I pull your average man or woman off the street, and say, why do you think your life's getting worse? 50 or 60% of them are saying inequality. If we get that, then I can make the Labour Party change policy. But th so therefore, politicians are culpable. It's political decisions yeah. and policies that need to be changed in order for people's lives to be improved. They are, but we, we can't control the politicians, Bex. We, can't control, we can only control ourselves. And what, what, I what I want people to do is to build knowledge and understanding in their communities, their families, their society. Because... Listen, don't get me wrong, I know you and I both, we talk to politicians at times, and there will be times when we need the politicians. Don't get me wrong, but unless we have the man and woman on the street at our backs, these politicians are not going to give us what we need. So I would encourage everybody here to think about the message that the reason living standards are falling is because of growing inequality. And then to think about the fact that inequality is still growing really quickly and what that means for the future. And, you know, if you believe that... Go and tell your friends, tell your family, tell your mum, tell your dad, tell your cousin, tell the guys at football, tell the guys at church, you know, just tell whoever you can. Get this message out there. If enough people accept this, if you look historically, the one time we got this, a decrease in inequality, we all got it. And that was because it was broadly understood that we needed it. Um, I think that, listen, it's, it's not going to be easy. I talk at the end of the book about trying to find a game I can't win. And when I walked away, I walked away from a lot of money to do what I do now, and I'm well aware that I'm fighting against people a lot richer and a lot more powerful than me and we're probably not going to win. But I'm fighting anyway, and if enough people fight as well, 
then we will win and we can. Well, this is where we disagree, right? <laughs> okay. Because not on the winning thing. Yeah. I, I, th I think we. I'm very hopeful. Okay. I'm feeling really optimistic at the minute. Glad I think that things that. are changing. I, yeah. I, I genuinely believe that. The fact that, you know, the majority of the British public are in support of things like a wealth tax, the introduction of wealth tax, yeah. including conservative voters, okay. right? You've got a growing group of millionaires who are also out there wanting to talk about it in yeah. public, which is the, exactly the kind of people you need to move along with everybody else. Yeah. 68% of millionaires in this country want to see the introduction of a wealth tax, right? Okay. So we pulled them a couple last year and, and that's, that's what we got back. On top of that, you've got this huge international movement for talking about the introduction of wealth taxes through the G20. You've got fantastic new ideas like a riches line that Ingrid Robbins is talking about and <coughs> setting a cap on how much wealth someone can have. To me, it feels like there is a sea change. And I'm not saying it's going to be next year, yeah. but I think within a decade, we're going to have to see that change come in, and there are the ideas there. There's the appetite there. All right. I'm hopeful. Ha are you? Listen, Bex. You keep doing what you're doing. I'll keep doing what I'm doing. <laughs> and if enough people out here and people like these people do it as well, then we have a chance. You know. And and listen, I wouldn't do what I do if I didn't think we had a chance. We've yeah. got a chance. And um, listen, it just takes enough people to to step forward and, and and work for it. And I know you work very hard, and I'm very appreciative of the work that you do. And and I'm going to keep doing it, and um, you know, I put these videos out there for you guys to, to, to help understand what's happening and to share them and, and to help with the movement. I don't even see people as giving out leaflets at Bank Station yeah, yeah, today yeah. Yeah. about where's the money, who's got the money, you know. I wrote this book to help build this message, and I do the YouTube to help build the message, and, uh, and it's growing, and, and we do have a chance, and people want, people want something different. So, yeah, I believe we can get it, so, so let's try our best. Amen. Thank, thanks very much, uh, Bex and, and Gary, for that fantastic uh, conversation. Lots of issues, I'm sure many, many questions. And we're going to have questions both online and from the audience. So if you are online, please use the Q&A function to pose your questions. Um, if, and if you're in the room, think about the questions. When you introduce yourself, please say a little bit about who you are and where you're from, where your affiliation is. Keen to hear from a variety of voices. What I think we'll do is get us two or three questions in, in, a, in a grouping and if it's a comment that's okay <laughs> get, you know, get your thoughts on the issues we've been discussing um, and also Bec get Bex's comments from Patriotic Millionaires as well as Gary's because there's an interesting important discussion about how we address the issues here which Bex has a lot to say about so let's begin with in, in person who would like to kick off um, at the front Kirsty yeah thank you I'm Kirsten Sainbrook I'm the Acting Director of the Inequalities Institute. Um, so I know this is not what you wanted to do in terms of you know, becoming a politician, but just imagine for one second you're sitting at the next cabinet table under a new government with a very large majority. What would you do? What would you prioritise? How would you go about this? How would you reign in the city? You know, I'm not aggressively about reigning in the city. I think it's about, it's about my, my focus is on, on wealth of individuals, because these are the guys, and, and fam, realistically, it's families. These, these guys are individuals, very, very wealthy families. These are the guys that are taking over everything, and it's hard to measure, because they're hard to, they're not in the statistics, because they don't reply to, like, wealth surveys. Um, you, you need to have a focus on the flows of, of wealth. You need to have a focus on the flows of wealth. And the, the way to measure that, really, in my mind, is, is wealth flowing back to ordinary families, and is wealth flowing back to government, um, because we have this kind of mad thing, which is, I say we need to tax the rich, and people say, oh, but their money's tied up in assets. Mm. You, don't want to make them tie them, you don't want to make them sell their assets. Listen, if you give all the assets to a guy who has £200 million a year passive income, and he never sells an asset, you can't be surprised when ordinary kids can't buy homes. Listen, we need the rich to, to sell their assets, because otherwise, ordinary families will never get assets. I think we need a complete change, but... So you, you need to look at, you have to talk about taxation of the very rich. Realistically, you have to talk about taxation of very large inheritances. Um, you need to have a really watertight focus on making sure you do not get avoidance at the top. I always remember when they brought in that second home stamp duty levy, an extra 3% on second homes. And they put in an exemption for anyone who buys more than seven properties at once. And then Jeremy Hunt immediately bought seven properties. And the thing is, there's a big motivation for these guys to put wealth tax on the front door and then to put a load of secret loopholes in the back for them and their mates. Um, so 
People are cynical and skeptical of taxation as wealth, and so they should be, because they know that, that there's a big incentive for powerful people to get, to get rich people out of the loop. So, um, you know, I focus on building the campaign. There are people such as Aaron Advani, who we work with, who's an economist at work, that look a lot more at the design of the systems, and there's people here who look at these things as well. Um, I would love to be in there to make sure the loopholes are not there. Um, it's not going to be easy, but you need to get wealth flowing out of, of rich families and, and back towards ordinary families and back towards the government, because otherwise... Ordinary families fall into poverty and we're going to lose our welfare state. We're seeing it in front of our eyes. Okay, there's a question in the blue jacket there. Hiya. Um, my name's Jay Mark Dodds. And um, I'm very interested in knowing how we can bring capitalism down together. <laughs> and just a little bit of backstory to me. I'll try and keep it brief. I get very anxious in public situations, but I'm a former publican. I had a tie lease on a pub in Camberwell for the Sun and Doves multiple award-winning pub. I did everything that capitalism demands. I'm an entrepreneur. It led to my, after several rent reviews, eviction, homelessness, three years, bankruptcy in 2011. I co-founded the Fair Punk campaign in 2006, which led to the pub's code coming into place in 2016. When that was announced in government, 360 million quid was wiped off the value of the pub codes the next day. And I've got an idea that there's a possible way of saving Britain's pubs together, which tallies with your experience. The last thing is, I feel as though I learned everything that you've learned through the belly of the beast in Citibank by being the victim of that at the other end. Okay, I think you, you messaged me a few times on Twitter, maybe. I have. Yeah, save the pubs. Yeah, sorry, I'm you, getting you, a lot of messages at the moment. No, just, yeah. just one thing, 3 a.m., a couple of nights ago, I couldn't sleep. I sent you a tweet and you liked it within two seconds. Well, yeah, it's, um, I was in Dublin on the weekend. <laughs> it was St. Patrick's Day. Um, um, I get, well, Beck's going to give her opinion on this. I, I get, sometimes I get a little bit worried when people talk about bringing down capitalism. The reason I say that is, you, you look at the, how living standards have fallen in the last few years, like really, really dramatically, lots of people falling into poverty, and it, it's... it's you know, I imagine most of us here are probably not on the very sharp end of it, although I'm sure we do have some who are. Um, that's going to get worse. It's going to get quite dramatically worse. Living standards are going to continue to fall. It's going to be really, really difficult. And sometimes, I, I, you know, people say we need to bring down capitalism. And I kind of, I feel a little bit like I'm on the Titanic and we're heading towards the iceberg. And I'm like, guys, let's turn the ship around. Let's dodge the iceberg. And someone says, well, do you think that ships are maybe not the ideal mode of intercontinental transportation. And it's sort of, I, I, so, uh, listen, I'm aware, listen, I, obviously I have this huge... Of course there are problems with the economic system that we live in, but also we are, we are at the risk of really serious disaster. And I know Beck is hopeful and we do have possibly positive change, but there are also very negative alternative voices coming up which will, which will sell very alternative possibilities and really bad things can happen here. And... Um, Half the country can't afford to simultaneously feed their kids and turn the heating on. And that number's going to get worse. And once we fix that, then you and I can sit down and we can talk about dismantling capitalism. But I think right now the situation is, is, is too urgent and we, we need to stop the disaster right now. I, I just add, I, I think actually what, what, and forgive me if I'm uh, misspeaking, but it's not necessarily capitalism that needs to be brought down, but it's ex this extremism, right? We have an extreme version of capitalism that we are living with now. Um, and I, I do worry about the, a conversation stuck in isms. Like, if you're obsessing over capitalism or socialism or Marxism or any of those isms, then actually you're playing yourself blind. We should not be talking about uh, having conversations that are, you know, 30 years old. What we should be doing is trying to form economies that work for us now, in, in the context that we have now, um, which aren't extreme and that don't lend themselves to extreme accumulation of wealth for a very few number of people. That's okay, one, one more question before we go online. Um, yeah, towards the back. In the, in the orange, jump the right at the back. <coughs> it's going to take ages to get the mic through. <laughs> Um, hi, my name is Ayush. I'm from SPJ London. And can my you put that down, please? Hello. Oh, Am I like, any chance you could stand up stand so up? I can yeah. see what you're sorry? Hi, my name is Ayush. I'm from SPJ London. And my question is as an individual who is uh, entering for a job or any sector, and I'm not so sure what to do, so is it better to be jack of various trades or be 
having a specified trait in myself so I can enter into a particular industry? I think it depends what it depends what you want, mate. It honestly depends what it depends. You know, the thing is, really what you want to do for a job is so depends on your personal situation. You know, I, I, I studied at LSE, so I know there's an extremely wide range of financial backgrounds here. And um, some people ask me sometimes, like, should I go into finance? And I think they maybe expect me to say, like, no, don't go into finance. But um, if I didn't go into finance, so who helps my brother buy a house? You know, who helps my sister buy a house? Um, who helps me buy a house, for that matter? Um, it, I think it, it's going to depend on your personal situation. Um, if you really know what you want to do now, then, then gun for it and go for it. You, you, you look quite young, um, I would think. <laughs> Give yourself a bit of time, man, and follow your heart, mate. Great. Pete, Pete, do we have any online questions? Yep. Let's see. The first question is from Martin Anthony, who says he is Gary's personal <laughs> tutor in the maths He's department. Not here. He should be here. <laughs> um, many years ago, um, yeah, he says you were a brilliant and memorable student. Um, his question is: um, You pointed out the obsession with internships. Um, if you were able to offer one piece of advice to our second-year undergraduate students as they start to scramble around for internships, what would it be? Um, second question is uh, Louise, White, Louise White, who's a city worker, um, who asks, is the problem in the UK that we are stuck between the US model and the European with taxation too low but culturally no desire for higher taxes because of the well-advertised falsity that everyone can get rich if you work hard enough? Um, yeah, I'll just do those two. Yeah, so Martin Anthony was my personal, I don't know if you've ever met him, he's the master I know of him, I know yeah, him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Really nice guy. I remember sitting in his office like towards the end of third year and he was like, I had pretty good grades in my, in my undergrad and he was like, stay on and do a maths masters. And I was like, mate, I'm going to go be a millionaire. And he was like, <laughs> fair enough. Um, it's such a hard question because obviously one part of me, listen, I guess we've got a lot of LSE students here, a lot of LSE students, and, and second year, it's so straight you come in, especially if you come from like a, like poor background like me, you come in, everybody's gone mental, right? Everybody's just got, lost their minds, right? Coming in in suits and, you know, they're clustering around, like 20 people around a computer doing a numerical test for JP Morgan, you know what I mean? And it's, it's, um, it is stressful, and I didn't apply for any internships because of that. Um, but it would be easy for me to turn around and be like, don't apply for internships, follow your dreams, you know what I mean? But, you know, my sister works in the arts, hard. Difficult. It is so difficult. So I'm not going to turn around and be like, don't, don't get the job, don't go work for the bank. I mean, you'll read the book, you'll see, like, it's not like a field of dreams. I'm sure you've got a lot of people who work in banking. Um, but you, it, it's not as final as it feels when, it's, when you're 19. That's what I will say, you know. Um, you, it's not like if you, if, you, if, you don't, if you miss the boat then, your life's going to be ruined. It's, it's, it's not... It's not like that, you know, you, you do get more chances. It but I think it's because of just what you said, like that, we're endlessly told you've got to be competitive. If you yeah. don't do it now, you're going to miss the boat, you know, and that's the same as like that cross, uh, the hype between the US and the European model, you know. We're con we've, we've been gifted this psychology that you've got to succeed, you've got to succeed, and then everybody's dissatisfied if they're not yeah. succeeding, if they feel like they're failing. Yeah. So I agree, like at 19, you yeah. do not have to lock yourself into something, yeah. even if the whole world is telling you, I'll tell you one thing that I think is important. When you're like young in second year, you don't realise how much unfairness there is behind the scenes. Like, so I'm in and, you know, I can talk about it now, about how all these other guys had like founded these charities and played over at the Royal Albert Hall. But at the time, what you just see is, why are all these guys so much better than me? Yeah. Why are all these guys so much more successful than yeah. me? Why are all these guys getting their internships? A lot of these guys get internships because their dad works for the bank, mate. Like, this is like, you know, you know, it's sort of, so one thing I would say is, I think it can be helpful to understand how unfair the game is. Because if you don't come from the right background, it's designed for you to lose. It's designed for you to lose. And you're probably going to lose because it's not a fair game. Mm. And if you lose that game, you might not go on to get the best job and you might not go on to be a millionaire. But it doesn't mean you can't get a good job and have a good family and be a good mum or a good mean, dad or, you know. It doesn't mean you're a failure, right? Yeah. Like, that's the, I, I, I listened to an interview you did um, a little while ago. Sorry to monopolise. But you, you, you'd said to somebody, you know, or you'd said, what people have to understand is it's not your fault, yeah. right? And I think that's such a powerful thing to remind people of. Like, our economy is set up yeah. for you to lose. 
So yeah, it's yeah. not your fault if you're losing. It's so yeah. important. I think that's really important to understand. Yeah. And for both for ourselves and for others. Yeah. Like understanding the fairness. Because I see what it does to young people when like like I've got mates, they don't understand why they why they can't buy a house. Yeah. And I, I've got another mate who's like his mum gave him half a million quid. But this guy doesn't know that his mum gave him yeah. half a million quid and they're just like, Why, why can't what I, have I done wrong? Why can't yeah. I get an internship? This guy got an internship and you know, this guy's dad is like the Sultan of Dubai or something. You know, he does <laughs> don't know that, right? Like So I think yeah, um if you can step away and realise like the game is rigged and if you get a chance if you get like a little squeak in and you can you can go and take people down go and do it but listen if you don't get through the door understand that the door was never made for you and you, you, it was, you were designed to lose and there are other things you can do with your life you know um, mm -hmm. so look just just don't beat yourself up yeah, don't beat yourself up we'll go next question second question yeah the UK um, I actually think sometimes it's a bit worrying when um we focus excessively on this is a UK specific problem because this is happening everywhere. Okay, the, the, what has happened in the last few years in the UK is maybe particularly bad compared to other places. But I get messages on the YouTube from basically every country in the world, it's the same here. You think about Australia as like a very strong economy. I get messages every day, it's the same in Australia, it's the same in Australia, it's the same in Italy, it's the same in the US. It, the direction of travel is the same. Basically, there's two places in the world, a place where you can't get a job and a place where you can't afford a house. And that's happening everywhere. That's happening everywhere. And when we sort of, you know, like, beat up on the UK, like, excessively, it creates a situation like, well, the problem is just here and we can leave. And then that is disempowering because actually the problem is not just here and we can't leave. This is a global problem and we need to fight it. And, you know, when we say it's a problem in one country, it encourages us to run away. And if we run away, we will lose and we have to, we have to fight. And we have to be internationalist about that. We have to understand. There'll be people here from many, many countries, and I'm sure... Loads of them will tell you it's the same where I'm coming from. Mm -hmm. Inequality is increasing, housing is becoming more expensive, wages are not keeping up. So it's, it's, it's not a UK specific problem. Can I uh, abuse chair's privilege? Um, and I'm very pleased I'm a sociologist, not an economist, after what Gary said. But <laughs> you, I'm interested in the theme of class, which is something sociologists talk about a lot, you know? And you mm -hmm. talked about class background. Uh, so two questions. One of them is, um, you know, how, how important is class identity to you? Do, do you feel yourself actively as a working class boy? Or is the kind of class thing a bit of a throwback yeah. to the past, which isn't really part of who you are? But also that leads to the question about politics, which is, would it be helpful to stir up more class, sense of class yeah. solidarity, class antagonism, and has the kind of eclipse of the language of class, which you see, for instance, the Labour Party? Yeah. Is that part of the problem which we need to try yeah. and tackle? You know, you know, there's a growing conspiracy on the internet that my like way that I dress is like a like a thing that I've made up, like an image that I've <laughs> carefully crafted, and that, that I put this accent on, and when I go home, I'm like eating off of like gold mm -hmm. plate cutlery. Um, what is that? That's what you do. Been to your yeah. house and then. Don't tell him. <laughs> um, when I was a kid, somebody told me. He's a guy in the book actually, named Asad. This is his real name. He said, if you want to get anywhere, you're going to have to change how you talk. And I was maybe 17, 18. And even then, I thought, if I change how I talk, there's no point getting anywhere. <laughs> like, you are what you are, you know what I mean? But at the same time, I think it's important that we don't allow class to divide, divide us excessively. Yeah. Because you know, what, I, what I envisage happening in the next few years is like a big increase in house prices. We're already seeing a big increase in asset prices. Mm -hmm. That is such a dangerous divide in our society because there's a lot of people in this country that own their own home or their parents own their own home. And there's a lot of people that don't. And that is, I know class is complex, it's not as simple as that, but that kind of runs along a little bit of a class yeah, yeah, line. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you yeah. can see the potential for, you know, very wealthy people to send this line that's like, the, the problem is the poor. The problem is the poor, to try to get the middle on side. And until the middle, the problem is the, the poor problem is the middle. And there is a group of people, which is a very small but very powerful group of people, that are progressively taking everything. And the only way that we stop that is if we, we find ways to unite to stop it. Because the only power we have that they don't have is power in numbers. Mm -hmm. And if we allow ourselves to be divided, we will lose. Mm -hmm. we, will, we, will, we will lose. So, you know what? I definitely sort of, I, I lean into where I'm from and... and I'm from East London, but I get messages from all over the country, from people in, in Glasgow, in Birmingham, in Belfast, and in Manchester, who resonate with the way that I speak, because it sounds like I'm from a place, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. Um, and I think in, in that sense it helps bring us together, but it can also divide us, because class is a very, has a very long history in this country, 
and, and division based on class. I've seen it, it's affected my life. Um, yeah. yeah, no, I mean, uh, I consider myself a, you know, working class background, middle class life now. I think that's probably a safe way to express who I am. And it's very weird, like, crossing class boundaries and living in different worlds. Like, from a tiny town in North East Yorkshire to Oxford, I, I did have a mental breakdown when I went there for the first time. I found it just completely overwhelming because, I, like I said, I, I didn't really know that class existed. But it wasn't that big a deal to me at that time. It was a big deal to other people. I had a tutor who said to me, um, <laughs> The thing is, Oxford was better when we used to have college ties with established schools, right? And, and to a kid who come from like a comprehensive school, you know, and you get to Oxford and, and people are asking you which school you went to, you don't know why you're at, they're asking you that. That was, that was pretty overwhelming. So I don't think that it's, a, like, I don't think that, I'm not of a mindset that it's the working class versus everyone else. If I was of that mindset, I certainly wouldn't be doing what I'm doing, right? Like I've set up Patriotic Millionaires in the UK, which is about making sure that millionaires share this mission that we have to overcome economic inequality. The more that you allow people or the system or whoever, the small group of people to divide, the less chance you've got of yeah. succeeding. Great. So more questions from the floor? Yeah, uh, in the middle, in the, green, in the green shirt, yeah, glasses. Hi guys, uh, my name's Kunle. Um, so I'm from Northwest London, not far from uh, Kilburn, which you know, so it wasn't Green Harsden. Uh, grew up sort of quite poor, working class background. Uh, managed to work hard to get to Trinity College, Cambridge. So when you guys talk about the sort of, the barriers you faced, I very much faced that, sort of yeah. questions about what school you went to. Uh, so my personal thing was what bike I brought to Cambridge. So I came with what the BMX. bike? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I, I came with the BMX bike. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, but that's just the bike I had. But that was a source of, uh, sort of, I guess, being picked on. Uh, so having to change that bike very soon to a road bike in second year. Uh, but my question really is about the book and more about you and some ideas I have. Um, I wanted to ask what Billy thought about your book, if he's read it. Mm. Yeah. Um, what the discussions were there and perhaps any other sort of characters in the book. Um, and then also, just for me as a consumer, not for a while, I shouldn't use that word, but someone who watches your channel, uh, conversations with Billy or conversations with your dad or even Harry yeah. would be sort of something I'd really lo love to watch. Yeah, so Billy, I, I wanted to get Billy to come to that. I had a friends and family launch and I really wanted Billy to come. Uh, some guys did come, Snoopy came, Spengler came and Titsy came. Um, Billy sent me a message a week before saying, sorry lad, I'm getting my kitchen renovated so I'm going to be in Marbella. And uh, he's in Marbella. <laughs> He's still in Marbella, and he's, he said he's going to get his daughter to bring the book out, so he's not had a chance to read it yet. Um, all the other people think Snoopy loves it. Arthur Kapowski, later in the book, loves it. Um, Titsy wants me to say publicly that he's a very intelligent boy, <laughs> <laughs> which is true. Um, I still talk to, to Titsy uh, quite a lot, and Arthur, about markets. And, uh, you know, markets are the, one of the main ways I understand the world, and Titsy is a very smart guy. He was very young, very like, junior. He's kind of used in the book as a, like, a proxy for like, all stupid young economists who've just come out of university, but he is a very smart boy. Um, you know, some of them are like more... Listen, when you write a book like this, it's a funny thing maybe you don't think about, but... You expose a lot of people who are, who are quite close to you, you know what I mean? And obviously, like, Harry is in the book quite personally, and even someone like JB is in the book quite personally. And, and I did my best to speak to them. I spoke to Wizard as well and just said, you know, this is it. And Wizard said, this is just the kind of bullshit I knew you would do. Um, uh, you know, it's tricky when you write a bit like this. Sometimes you feel bad, for, and I try my best to disguise these people. Um, they're never going to come on the channel. The anyone who works in finance will never come on the channel, unfortunately. It's just the way that it works. I, of course, I would love for them to come on, but it's just not what they do. Um, are they all still working in finance, though? The older guys are mainly retired now. Yeah. Billy and JB are retired now. Some of them still work at Citibank. You know? mm -hmm. I just have to be a bit careful what I say, because I can't sort of say who's where and who's doing what. Um, but I'm glad the characters resonate with you, because these are, you know... These, these, these are like a second family to me. Even guys like Spengler, who's like a bit despicable, he's... In a weird way, a really nice guy. And it's sort of, and I, I really I had the rule when I wrote the book like, every bad character does at least one good thing, and every good character does at least one bad thing. Because I was sick of these stereotyped portrayals of trading floors, and I just wanted I wanted it to, to be real. And I want 
I want you to get the message that like, this is not a problem of bad individuals ruling the world. It's a bad system yeah. ruling individuals. And um, I hope that came through. And um, nothing wrong with BMXs. Yeah. <laughs> So we have, we have this very important discussion about the uh, masculinity. If it's, um, it's concerned to get some female voices yes, this we should. in the audience. Yeah, there's one here. Yeah. Who's this case? Just your mic, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ray Sibbit. Hi, Ray Sibbit. I work in government. Um, Wizard came across as a very kind character. So I know there weren't very many women on the trading floor in, in the book, but she came across very strongly for me. Yeah, it was, it was a funny one, like... I'm, I met to this, some of you not read the book, I, I, one of my ex-girlfriends, Wizard, is in the book. One of the weirdest experiences of my life is being in a recording studio, having to do an impression of my ex-girlfriend for 10 years ago. Do we know? No, it's not going to do um, This girl turns up from Norwich, and at, at the time I was Citibank's most profitable trader in the entire world, and she just did not give a shit. And it kind of, uh, it was a big thing for me, mm. and it kind of made me realise, like, what? This is all kind of bullshit, isn't it? It's all kind of bullshit. And there's one scene where... I've just like got my like, big, big bonus, like massive, like multi-million pound bonus, and I'm, I'm back at home, like I'm on, in the corner of my front room in my little office, like trying to do my investments. And she comes home, and I can, I can see as soon as she sees me that she's like worried, and I'm already pissed off. And she comes and she's like, "Are you right?" And I'm like, "Yeah, I'm fine. I'm fine." She's like, "Well, you don't seem fine. You seem a bit stressed out." And I'm like, "Well, it's a lot of money I've got to invest it." And then she's like, "If I'd made as much money as you just made." the last thing I would be doing is sitting in the corner of my front room, stressing out. And I think I put in the book, I realised immediately she was right, and I really fucking hated her for that. Mm -hmm. And a lot of my uh, guys who I know who are still working in finance have messaged me about specifically that line. And they're like, why did you say that? And I think the reason that they're messaging me about that line mm -hmm. is because they all know she's right as well. Mm -hmm. And they don't want me to say that. They don't want me to say that. Because so many people working in finance are kind of trapped in this life where they need half a million quid a year just to live. But they all know they should be doing something. They all know it's not right in their heart of hearts. You know what I mean? And I think I was very lucky to have met someone who told me when I was still young and, and, and free and able, able to get out. Have you seen The Graduate? No. There's this bit at the end of The Graduate where this, like, this, woman, this girl, young girl trying to escape her wedding and her mum's like, no, you can't go. It's too late. It's too late. And the girl says to her mum, not for me. And I think that there's this big split between like, me and, and Caleb in the book. Caleb is the man who left, but he couldn't leave. And I left, and, and thankfully I'm, I'm still not in it. And it was thanks to, to people like Wizard and other people in my life that, that kept me close to that reality that there are other things that are important, and maybe money is not the be all and end all. And I'm glad you liked her character. She'll be, she's very popular, she's, I've told her. She's not really, she's got it. It's only come out, she lives in Australia now. It only came out like a week ago. She's getting through it. If she hadn't been around, do you think, you'd have, do you think your cast would have been different? It's so hard to know, isn't it? It's, when you're so young, you meet one person that mm. can change your life. And, and, and I don't know, you know, maybe there's another world where I'm, where I'm Caleb or I'm Gerald Gunn and I'm sitting depressed next to a computer somewhere, mm. you know, with a massive house I never go back to and a beautiful family Fair I never see. Don't yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, I don't know. I'll probably never know. Mm. Should we get a couple more questions online if there are any? Uh, first question is from Aaron Daddy, who's a year 12 student. Um, he says, so I know you studied uh, econ and maths at LSE. Uh, how did you find that the things that you learned on your undergraduate course um, compared to what you experienced in the real world? Um, second question, um, what, if anything, did writing the book help you to atone for from your experiences? Um, and what impact do you personally hope to have on the wider social, political, and economic landscape? Uh, so first, what I studied here. So I did maths and economics here. I love maths. I love maths. I always loved maths. Like maths is like my big sort of ticket out, and I loved it, and I spent a lot of time studying maths. I, I, what I found really interesting is there's the difference between the... Like, the the psychology of the maths professors and the econ professors. Like, if you ask a maths professor a weird question, he absolutely loves it, and he'll spend like 10 minutes like going mental about this weird question. But if you ask an economics, the economics professors, not all of them, so defensive when asked questions, and I found that like such an interesting. Exactly. They don't really. They just sort of think, oh crap, I don't know. What yeah. I'm but um. Uh, so I think economics itself, I've been very outspoken about the way that economics is and the way that modern economics education is, and I think it's like a bit rubbish. But 
as a trader, having an economics education is really useful because you make money as a trader by understand, but when people are wrong. And if people are wrong but you don't know why they're wrong, then maybe you don't know something. But if you've studied, if you've been at universities and you know exactly why, what they're thinking, and you know exactly why they're going to predict what they're going to predict, and you know exactly what they're missing, it was that that gave me the confidence to sort of back, like big, back big that these guys are wrong. So in a way, the most useful thing from study economics was that I learned that like economics is a bit rubbish, and I learned like exactly specifically why. And I think like as a trader, that's, that's really useful. And I think also as like a critic of our economy that we live in. Um, and I think one of the great sort of tragedies of economics is that we have this system that takes kids like me at 21 and says, if you want a public voice, you're going to have to like sit in a dusty room in inverting matrices for 15 years, or you can go and work in a skyscraper and be a multi-millionaire in three years. And I think it really effectively takes like, a lot of the interesting voices out of the system. Um, so you know, I would encourage anyone who's a talented young economist, you know, don't let them silence you. you know. If you need to go make your money, make your money, but you know, come back and speak publicly when you can. Um, the second question, what, sorry, what was the second question? It was, can you remind me quickly? So oh, how do I atone for my sins? Yeah. How do I atone for my sins? No wonder I forgot that. I blocked that one out. Um, we had a massive fight about the subtitle, A Confession. I didn't like it. I was like, what are you saying? You sound like a bad guy. Um, but I actually like it because it raises this kind of like moral question of about... Because actually, it's, it's this weird thing which people will go, like, you bet on the collapse of society, you're bad. And like, well, you know, my job is to bet on the collapse of society, so what do you want me to do? <laughs> you, know, is my, do you want me to make the wrong bet? Um, and, you know, a very, like, a big moment for me is my young... When I put this, like, disaster trade on, that society's going to collapse at the beginning of 2011, this mad thing happened, which, of course, I hadn't been betting on, which was there was a massive earthquake in Japan, and 20,000 people died in this earthquake in Japan. And I made $11 million in, like, a week on the back of this earthquake in Japan. And um, what can you say about that, right? Does that make me a bad person? I put a bet on, society's going to collapse. Then there's an earthquake. And what was the maddest thing about that was like people start looking at you on the trading floor like, damn. How did you do it? This guy's a good trader. And you're like, you think I caused the earthquake in Japan? But it's sort of... Actually, personally, I don't think I'm that bad guy. I think, you know, I, I, I wanted intentionally to, you know, draw out some of the negative features of my personality in the book. And it's sort of... I, you know, people who, like me, are obsessed with making money and being successful when they're young. There's usually a reason, you know, and I don't discuss that in the book, and, but it's, it's not just me. Mm. Everyone where I'm from wanted to go work in them skyscrapers, and everybody wants to make the money. And um, I sort of presented myself almost semi-intentionally as a bit of a dickhead in the book, because I want to I wanna say, listen, this isn't about who the dickheads are. This is about do you want your society to collapse or not? And, you know, if you're going to wait for the second coming of some perfect guy, you're going to be waiting a long time, mm. you know. You know, what you've got is me and a bunch of other imperfect guys who are trying our best, and you're all imperfect guys as well. Um, so I do it. Listen, I, there are people in the book that I felt that I didn't treat well in the time of the book, and I've reached out to them, and then I've spoken to them, and I've said my apologies, and I've said my apologies to the people that I need to apologise to. Do I think I need to apologise to society for bringing myself and my family out of poverty? No, and I'll never apologise for that, and I don't think anybody should be made to apologise for that. But... Does that take me away from an obligation to try and fix things? No, I think we all have that obligation. And, and I think, you know, because I have a voice and because I have the... Because I'm financially capable to fund a YouTube channel and stuff like this, I have more responsibility. But I'm not the only one with responsibility. All of you have responsibility. Every single person here has a responsibility. And maybe you don't have the voice I have, and maybe you need to work every hour God sends. You know what I mean? There's, there's this story in the Bible of the widow's might, of the widow who puts her last two coins in the box. And Jesus says, she's given more than anyone because that's all she has. And um, listen, I'm, I'm lucky because I have this voice. I have a bit more of a, a louder voice than others. And I have the finances to fund things like a YouTube channel. And I've been able to do that for free for years. But you've all got a voice as well. And it's not as loud as mine. And um, I'm not apologising until we fix things. And maybe when we fix things, we can have a talk about that. OK, we've got about five minutes left. So we, we have one more round, I think, of the audience there. Uh, yeah, in the, in the striped jumper. Hello, my name is Ben. I'm just a fan of your YouTube channel. Um, uh, my question is kind of to do with what Rebecca called was the solutions area. I, th I think it's not unfair to say that wealth inequality taxes never work. That's a bit brutal thing to say. Um, 
I'm not an uh, economist by any stretch of the imagination, but I think I read uh, like seven years ago, there was a globally agreed um, uh, internet sales tax where basically, you know, um, Amazon and Google were just getting too many profits. So I believe all the countries agreed almost like at a UN level uh, for this 15%, this is how I remember it, uh, internet sales tax. So when I get into arguments with uh, my friends about Gary economics, because I try and be a proponent of it, they always hit me with that, which is very valid. So could we combine the template of the internet sales tax with wealth tax, because then the wealth owners won't uh, offshore their assets, because that's historically what's happened <coughs> in the past. Sorry, that's a bit of a convoluted Yeah, question. you want to go? Yeah, uh -huh. I, so that's exactly what's happening right now. This is what I'm really excited about. At the minute, the, so, that happened in 2021. It happened through a process at the OECD, right? 15% minimum effective tax rate on corporations. It kind of set a precedent that we've been talking about for the last few years. If you can do that for corporations, why can't you do that for very rich people at the international level? And this year, Brazil is the president of the G20, and they are very open to the conversation on instituting kind of minimum standards for how you tax the super rich. How you do that, it's not very clear, but there are very, very clever people, much cleverer than me, working on that. And there is appetite for it. So Brazil have come out and said they're supportive of it. France has come out and said they're supportive of it. The work that we have to do across the next six months is to get other G20 countries to come out and say they are supportive of it as well. It is the beginnings of a process, but it is incredibly exciting. Because yes, you're absolutely right. International collaboration does mean that you have much less chance of capital flight. For me, this is a time of opportunity, and as Gary says, the more people talking about this and raising their voices about it, the more chance we have of succeeding. Yeah, all I will say is, um, I don't campaign for world taxes because I think they're easy. I campaign for world taxes because I think they are necessary to prevent the collapse of society. Yep. And they're hard, they're hard, but if we don't get them, society will collapse. And um, I think if you look at historically, you know, if you look at you know, Western Europe in the 60s and 70s, we had much higher levels of inheritance taxes. And my dad worked for the post office and bought a house, you know what I mean? And all my mates' dads who come over from Pakistan, you know, working in shops, bought houses. Mm -hmm. And that was, you know, we had much lower levels of wealth and equality. We did have periods of higher taxation. You know, it's, it's now it's, there's not a lot of effective, but there was in the past. And um, I think it can be done. I don't think it's easy. And I think it's also worth saying, you know, I don't think I'm going to be the guy that, number one, campaigns for it, number two, designs the whole thing, number three, implements the whole thing. You know, this is going to, this is going to be, you know, you know, I am, what I have is, is much more direct access to ordinary people who are not getting good information. I'm trying to persuade them. Um, if I feel that we win the public, and listen, I'll work with Bex as well, and if I feel we're in a situation where we can actually get the tax in, then I'll try to be more involved in design. Um, but it's going to take a lot of people, and it's going to be difficult to design it, but I think we can do it. I couldn't believe the internet sales tax was globally agreed for a human nature thing. It's just... Yeah. This well, well, it shows, you know, we, the appetite is there. The appetite is, mm -hmm. the appetite is going. I think we can get it. Thanks. One more question. One more question. Um, any female? Yes. In the, there. Uh, my name's Zaya. I'm a student at Harris Westminster Sixth Form, and I'm also from East London. And I was wondering, how did you pick yourself back up after being excluded from school at 16? Oh, man. Man, I, I got expelled from school. I just turned 16. I was in, it was late October, like beginning of year 11. And, oh my God, my dad got called in. And I was like, hi. And um, my dad drove me home. And uh, all he said to me in the car was, what did it feel like? And I was just like, oh, fine. And I woke up in the middle of the night. My mum was crying at the end of the bed. And I remember thinking, what are you crying for? You're not going to fix this. That's what, I that's what I thought at the time. I'm not saying that's a good thing to think, but that's what I thought at the time. And uh, I woke up the next morning and my mum was at work and my dad was at work and my brother was at work and my sister was at school and I sat down in the bathtub and uh, we had this little like hose just stuck on it and I watched the water going down the drain and I thought that's your fucking life mate if you don't do something and one of my mates come around like I'm sorry you got expelled from school like do you want to go smoke up and that was like that's your moment and I said no and I just was there I didn't have a desk I was lying on the floor of my front room with a little wooden board studying every day maths homework French homework, physics homework, and I know that I'm very lucky that I'm the kind of person that is, has a natural aptitude for exams, and other people don't have that, and I, was, I, I sort of relied on, on the fortunate thing that I have that other people don't have. Um, but the decision was there and I made it, and it's harder, and other people made, made other decisions, and, and other people don't have the fortunate things that I have, but 
sometimes in life you've got to be strong and you know the, I think the book in, is in ways about how you can be too strong and if you're too strong it can it can cause problems for yourself and for others but you know I know life's hard when you're when, when you're poor and, and you, you've got to make it happen and I know it's hard yeah but that, that's what I did thank you okay I'm gonna ask Beckton and Gary to give last comments in a minute before I do that just two two things I want to say which is if this goes back to the issue about what, what we all need to do something about this and a number of us at the LSC are doing are, are doing really important research on wealth inequalities and we are having a major event on the 13th of May which will be showcasing some of the recent work around the challenges of wealth inequality and hopefully Gary and Beck will be able to come to that so if, if these issues uh, worry you and they should worry you I think you've got lots of reasons to worry about these things please do put this note in the diary and you'll hear more about this event in, on the website and through mailing lists so that's please put that, put that in your diaries second comment is more logistical when we've when we've given our uh, our thanks to Gary and Bex please can you stay sitting if you want to try and talk to Gary he will be available outside he'll be signing books but do not try and come to the stage otherwise we'll never get away so please at the end can you please stay sitting until Gary and Bex have left and then we'll be outside right? um, just anything any any last words you want to add to this conversation either of you before we um, say thank you? I would just like to thank everybody for coming. You know, this is my this is my undergrad. I studied here from two thousand five to two thousand and eight. This building didn't exist then. Um, <laughs> but look, it was an important time in my life, and I know this is a place that that trains people to make money and to be competitive. But you know, this is my hometown. This is my home university, and it means a lot to see people coming. Um, you know, if you can get the book, you know, I know it's. <clears throat> Twenty-five pounds is a lot for some students, but you know you can. I think it's a really good book. But you know, if you can't watch the YouTube, understand what's happening, share it around. You know, I do the YouTube for free because I'm trying to I'm trying to stop this. And, and I think if enough of us support, if we can, and you know, it's not just going to be me. You know, I could get hit by a bus tomorrow. It's, it's an idea that if you don't fix inequality, things will get worse. But if you do fix inequality, things will get better. So you know, if you take one thing away, take that idea with you and and share it, and, and then we can make things better. Thanks for coming. Thanks.